Hello and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. Today we're going to be looking at Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is kind of Paul's epitaph to his life. He knows he's in a Roman prison locked up facing execution. And so he's pinning this letter to Timothy to encourage him, giving him some final instruction about those things that are truly important. Today we're in the second chapter of 2 Timothy, and I thank you for joining us as we travel through God's Word together, seeking to truly grasp Scripture and what it means and how it applies to our lives. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer as we begin this journey together today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You have blessed us in so many ways. Not that you have removed all suffering from our lives, but Father, you have removed sin from our lives. The the weight of that sin, the penalty of that sin, as we have turned to you, seeking right relationship, seeking forgiveness through Christ. Lord, we thank you for that gift of salvation, that even in our suffering as we follow you, we still are united with Christ. We still gain that blessing. Help us to be faithful as Paul is encouraging Timothy to be faithful in these passages. Help us to focus on the things that matter and to let go of those things that don't and stay grounded in the foundation that is Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would open your word to us today, that we would not only hear it with our ears, but also with our hearts that your spirit would speak to us, give us understanding and wisdom as we study your word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we begin the second chapter in the first verse, we see Paul giving Timothy an encouragement to, to be strong in the grace of God and to remain faithful. Now, Paul, as he's looking around at his life and his ministry, has seen many points where he could have shied away, many points where things were difficult, but he stayed strong. Also, he saw many people, as we'll discuss a little bit later on, who turned their back, people who betrayed not just Paul, but the cause of Christ. And so he knows what the lack of faithfulness does and the pain that it brings but he knows what it is to be strong in grace and the blessing that is there. So he gives Timothy these words. He says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. There, there's the key, the root of our strength. The the way we can be strong is through the grace of God, through Christ. In verse two, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. You see, there's a lineage to faith. It doesn't just happen. It just doesn't spontaneously erupt out of nowhere. God chooses to work through his followers, even in the advance of the gospel. Could God just make himself known? Well, actually, Scripture tells us God makes himself known through all of creation. That all of creation proclaims the glory of God. But in our humanity, this is Romans chapter 1, in our humanity looking at nature, Our twisted, sinful state as humanity chose to start worshiping the things God created instead of the creator that they point towards. So there's that that constant pull back of our sinful nature. But the truth is we've got to stay rooted in Christ and we have to trust the truth that we have been taught, that we have seen borne out in the lives of others that were reliable witnesses. We've got to teach those things, and we need to teach them to people who are trustworthy and will carry it forward, because they will tell someone else, who will tell someone else, who will tell someone else. I came to know Christ in a small church through people that knew him as Savior and Lord because someone else had told them. And they shared it and showed it to me. And I came to faith. 
and I have seeked to lead others to come to know Christ, trying to be trustworthy and a faithful, reliable witness. Paul's encouragement to Timothy is to live as a reliable witness, just like he has seen it attested to in the lives of the people that entrusted it to him, it being the gospel, but also to seek to teach that truth to others, that they would pass it on to others. We're all part of this grand tapestry of God's work throughout history and of the advance of the gospel in our world. Don't sell yourself short. Understand we're called to faithfulness. We're called to obedience. We're called to go and tell. When we get to verse 3, we see a little bit of shift in focus. Paul is already talking about being strong, that rootedness, that, that grounding in grace and faithfulness. Now he's shifting a little bit to the suffering side of things. Now, this isn't a popular passage of scripture, really. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't see a whole lot of plaques hanging in stores as inspirational plaques that say, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We just don't see that. Why? Well, because it doesn't sell well, frankly. We like this notion that if we're right with God through Christ, then everything's going smooth and it'll all be great. But folks, that's a lie. Our eternal security is there in Christ. We have life and life, as John 10.10 10 says, to the fullest. But we're going to face challenges because the world the world is the enemy of Christ. And as we are united with Christ and we live for him and we proclaim him, we are at odds with the world. There will be suffering. So Paul's reminding Timothy to stay focused here. Hear what he says. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Why would he say a good soldier? Well, he's about to explain in verse four, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. In other words, if you're a soldier, you've got one job, to live as a soldier. Your concerns are all those concerns that fall under the realm of, for lack of a better descriptor, soldiering. Uh, it's military life. It's a mindset. It's a way of life. It's a way of seeing the world. It is, in fact, a worldview. It filters everything that you choose to do or not do what you see as valuable or a waste of time is all filtered through that rubric of military life. He goes on in verse five and athletes cannot win a prize unless they follow the rules. You know, if, if I go out and I compete, well, okay. First off, it's going to be embarrassing if I'm going out competing in some athletic event, cause I'm just not that athletic, but if I'm competing in an event that I don't understand the rules for because I haven't really paid attention, not only am I going to look like a doofus out there, but there's no way I'm going to win because I can't compete based on the rules and you don't win the prize if you didn't follow the rules to get there. An athlete cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. They have to live within that world. That has to be their focus. That has to be what they know and what they live out and what they prepare for. He goes on in six to talk about farmers. He says, and hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruits of their labors. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying to Timothy, look, you're going to face suffering, but that's okay. Because your focus needs to be in one place, and that is Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters, that applies to us too. Our focus needs to be in Christ Jesus. And out of that, out of that worldview, out of that focus, out of it all being about Christ, we make the decisions and we live out the actions that affect the world around us. But our rooting, our grounding is in Christ. It is in that grace that God gives us in Christ Jesus, as he says back in verse one. 
So here he's giving all these examples of different aspects of life that show what it is to be immersed in a, a mindset, a worldview as followers of Christ. And I don't even want to use the term Christian there because that's got a lot of baggage and a lot of people claim to be Christian, but don't know Christ or don't follow him. If you are a Christ follower, then he's got to be the center of your world. And him being the center of your world means that there are other things that other people consider important that become unimportant in your life. Just as that soldier focused on pleasing his commander and living that military life isn't real concerned about civilian affairs because he's got his own world to deal with. Christ should be our world. Is he yours? Now, picking up in verse 8, Paul begins to talk about his own suffering for Christ. So he's used all these other examples of, of individuals or professions maybe that are focused on their world and saying, we need to be like that, but we need to be like that with Christ. Now he gives a real example that Timothy knows. Timothy had a front row seat for some of this. And here's what he says. Verse 8, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be changed. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. What is Paul saying there? Well, when he focuses on saying, you know, always remember Jesus Christ. He was descended of King David and was raised from the dead. What's he saying? He's saying death has been defeated. He's saying even though Christ faced death, he experienced the resurrection. What does that mean? That means that we who follow him, we who know Christ, we who have received that good news, we have that promise of resurrection, and we've already seen it happen with Christ. So we can trust that it will happen for us through the power of Christ. And so we preach the good news, just like Paul. We tell others the good news. And he says, look, because I preach this good news, there's a consequence of doing it. Because I preach this good news, I'm suffering. And I've been chained like a criminal. And there again, he sees himself as united with Christ because Christ was tried as a criminal, was executed as a criminal. But he turns it around. He says, but the word of God cannot be chained. You may put the person in chains. You can't stop the word of God. And so based on that reality, the reality of the resurrection of Christ, the reality that it is the power of God that moves the gospel forward. It is the power of God to save, to redeem. He says, so I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. He wants to see the lost come to faith in Christ. And he's saying, I'm willing to endure anything because if I die, resurrection is in front of me. If I'm in chains, I know that that is not the end of the gospel because the word of God cannot be chained. So based on that reality, I'll take whatever's got to happen. I'll endure anything. If it's going to bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God's chosen. Well, he goes on to give us a series of quotes, if you will, here in verse 11 and following. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. And this, this is a nice little thing, a good thing to memorize, because it, it helps us remember what's important and where we're grounded. Verse 11, this is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. 
Now, all that's pretty straightforward, but I want to look at verse 13 there because there's several different ideas about what exactly does that mean? If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Well, one of the thoughts on that, and it's kind of the one I lean towards pretty heavily, is that when we sin, when we do not live as faithfully to Christ as we should, and we sin, he is still faithful. He still forgives. He still redeems. Our salvation is still there because it's not dependent on our righteousness, but his faithfulness. And so we have that assurance. Um, it also could mean that uh, even though some have, in Paul's experience, become unfaithful as followers of Christ, have turned away, have have become false teachers and chased after false beliefs and advocated those beliefs, that even though those individuals have reflected poorly on the gospel, Christ is still faithful. The gospel is still true. It's not dependent on the faithfulness of those advocating it. It's dependent on the faithfulness of the one who purchased it, Christ on the cross. So that's another viewpoint on that. And I think there's something to that too, because the, the truth of the gospel and the redeeming work of Christ isn't dependent on me and my faithfulness. Now, my faithfulness is a witness to that and can be a poor witness or a good witness, but it doesn't change the fact Christ died to atone for the sins of humanity. That doesn't change because I'm a sinner. It's made evident in that I am forgiven. And the reality is God cannot deny who he is. His character and nature is evident and it doesn't change, but it always shows. So there's a great few, just a couple of verses there that remind us of that grounding that Paul is encouraging Timothy to, that we remain grounded in Christ, that no matter what we face, we remain faithful witnesses, and we understand that even if it means suffering for the cause of Christ, for the advance of the gospel, it's okay, because we will see the resurrection, and the gospel cannot be chained. Have you ever faced a bunch of useless words. I don't mean, you know, you're, you're a student and you're given a, a vocabulary list and you're thinking, why do I need to know these words? I've never seen these and I've never heard them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more along the lines of, well, here in the United States, we just came through an election season. That's always a fun thing. Um, you hear all sorts of words during election season, campaigning. And the truth is, most of them are meaningless words. I mean, I have heard people claim that they will do all sorts of things if they're elected. And if you pay any attention to the job that they're running for, that position doesn't have the authority to do most of what they're promising. It's just meaningless words. Now, I'm not just slamming on politicians. I'm just trying to point out a few of the things in life that exemplify that there are words that are just a waste of time. God's word is not one of those. And Paul begins to remind Timothy here in the second chapter in verse 14 about what is important, about avoiding those words that are just useless and about dealing with those that oppose the gospel and even oppose Timothy's ministry in the gospel and how we should handle that. And maybe this is, maybe this is a very relevant passage for us. In today's world, we have social media. We have so many opportunities to weigh in on opinions on everything. And I think many times, most especially those things we know very little about. And the same is true in reverse, that everyone feels the ability to weigh in an opinion on what anyone else says, whether they have any knowledge of what they're talking about or not. Here in verse 14, Paul gives this guidance to Timothy. He says, remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop 
fighting over words. Such arguments are useless, and they can ruin those that hear them. You see, we as believers can become so distracted by seemingly important stuff that isn't kingdom stuff, by seemingly important things that are just distractions from the gospel and the call to follow Christ with our lives. And many times it's getting hung up on words and we start fighting over them. Now, where in scripture are we ever told as believers to fight with one another? Now, I'm not going to give you too much time to look it up because you're never going to find it. We're called to be united. We're called to love one another. We're called when there is a disagreement and someone is sinfully in the wrong to confront them, to confront them individually, to confront them as a few believers coming together, to confront them as the church coming to them. There's this structure to it, this, this flow, and every step of it is intended to be redemptive. But when are we called to argue about useless words when we're supposed to be living a life that pleases God, living a life that follows Christ? It's just not in there. I think maybe we need to refocus as believers in our modern world. Yes, there's much out there that is important to us. But is it really important to Christ? Or is it in that realm, back to the uh, admonition to Timothy, to think of the world like a soldier, focused on following Christ, to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and a soldier seeks to please their commander and doesn't worry about civilian stuff? How much of that falls in the realm of civilian stuff that we need not worry about? That we need to focus on our commander and being obedient to him. Again, Paul says such arguments are useless, and they can ruin those that hear them. Verse 15, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly explains the word of truth. You want to know where we need to focus? That's where it is. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Now, this doesn't mean earn your salvation, but this means if you know Christ is Savior and Lord, then work to please him. Be a good soldier. Be a good worker. Be a good follower of Christ. Be a good child of your loving Father. Not the opposite of that. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Verse 16, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like a cancer. We use the word cancer. Actually, the, the, the Greek there translates functionally gangrene, rot. This kind of talk leads to, to spiritual rot in our lives. As in the case of Hymenius and Philetus. Now, these guys, we've heard of Hymenius before. He shows up back in, um, I believe it's Paul's first letter to Timothy. He's warned against, along with a guy named Alexander. Alexander's dropped out of the picture now, and you now have Philetus teaming up with him. But they're advocating a heresy. And in fact, Paul explains that heresy as we go on. So let's read. They have left the path of truth claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they have turned some people away from the faith. There's, he's giving an example of those that have not been faithful, those that got tied up in all these words and explanations and stuff that wasn't following Christ. And it led to their ruin, and not only their ruin, but the ruin of others who have been led away from the true faith following this nonsense. Now, what were they advocating? They were saying the resurrection already happened. Well, what's that mean? We're not sure exactly what form of this heresy these two guys were advocating, but in the early church and, and around Ephesus, 
there were a couple of different heresies that wound up being common in the early church. One of them was this idea that the resurrection had already happened and therefore we were spiritually resurrected, so our physical bodies become irrelevant. In other words, whatever the physical body does has no bearing on our resurrected spiritual self and our relationship with God. This became a license to basically live as a hedonist because your moral behavior and what you did physically with your body didn't matter. It couldn't affect you spiritually and in your relationship with God. So you can see the problem there. There was also a flip side of that, another heresy that developed in the early church around this time. And it was the idea that um, we were spiritually resurrected already, that, that Christ had returned and we experienced the resurrection. And so though even though we still had our physical bodies, we were spiritually resurrected and therefore we needed to abstain from everything with our physical bodies. This is there, there is no marriage, there is no, you know, any of these things. And it, it took things to an extreme. And Paul addresses that in some of his other letters to the early churches, um, that, that, that became an issue to the extreme. Either you're totally removing yourself from the world and not functioning as a person, or you've become a complete hedonist and you live and and exist to engage in physical pleasure without regard for God because you say, oh, I'm spiritually good with God, so it doesn't matter what my body does. Both of those are extremes that are far from the gospel. And we're not to live in either one of those places. Both of those places are achieved by a lot of words but very little concern for God, very little allegiance to the gospel, very little following of Christ with our lives. And that's Paul's point. He's saying to Timothy, stay focused on this. Not only you stay focused, teach others to stay focused on living for Christ. And don't get sidetracked by all this nonsense. Now, just to clarify, what it is to follow Christ. We don't earn our salvation, but we seek to please God. Why? Well, number one, there is blessing in seeking to please God, but our faithfulness and our desire to please Christ is not to gain salvation, but is in response to salvation. It is that we have received the unmerited grace and favor, love of God, we didn't deserve it, and we never will. But having received such an awesome gift, we desire to please God. We desire to live for Christ. Now, how effective we are in living for Christ, well, that affects how useful we are for Christ. Paul says it this way in verse 20. He says, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions. The cheap ones are used for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the Master to use you for every good work. Wow, what a mental image. What sort of an instrument, what sort of a tool, a utensil do you want to be in the hands of God? Yeah, they're all useful. You know, in, in my house, we have our everyday plates and we have our china. We've been lugging that china around for 27 years now. Got it for our wedding. And we use it periodically. But it's a special occasion. In fact, it has the way of, if we just pull it out one night and use it for supper, it just elevates the meal. It makes an ordinary evening supper together as a family seem like something special and different because we're using these special plates or special utensils. The rest of the time, we just use our ordinary everyday stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. It's still useful. Hey, it's a whole lot better than, you know, trying to eat without 
plates and utensils. But it's just everyday functional. Still serves a purpose. Still meaningful. But it's just interesting how using the special utensils, the special plates, changes things, elevates things, makes it different, makes it, well, as this passage says, honorable. Now, what's that mean in our lives with this illustration? It means that if we know Christ, he'll use us. He will use us for his kingdom, for his work. But don't you want to be the kind of follower of Christ that is set aside for something really special? Don't you want to be the kind of follower that even though it looks like something every day is happening, when God uses you in the mix, it elevates things? It makes it special, like using our, our china and our, and our good utensils elevates the meal. It may seem like something ordinary, but suddenly it becomes special. Don't you want to be the kind of follower of Christ that when he uses your life in the lives of others or in whatever situation that you are placed into, it makes it special? Well, there's a way to set yourself apart to be that kind of a useful instrument in the hands of God. And that is, you've got to keep your life clean and be ready for the master to use you. How do you do that? Well, verse 22 kind of explains it. He says, run from anything that stimulates useful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. And we go, wait, wait, youthful lust, that's just natural. Yeah, it's natural, but it's also uncontrolled. Instead, we need to be more temperate in our desires. We need to understand that we live in obedience to Christ, and we need to bring all of our life under that obedience to Christ. We need to instead pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Who do you associate with? If you spend all your time hanging out with people that do not follow the Lord with pure hearts, you may try to convince yourself that you're an influence on them and you're going to bring them up. But the reality is they're going to bring you down. I know you may have that one anecdote out there, that one story you can tell that's an exception to the rule. But it's going to pull you down. You see, you need to watch those that you allow in that inner circle of influence in your life are going to influence you. Now, you need to seek to live as a good influence for the kingdom of God in the lives of others. But don't let into that inner circle of influence in your life those that do not follow the Lord with a pure heart. It will tear you down. It will make you something other than a special utensil set aside for honorable use. Stay pure and follow him. Now in the second chapter, Paul gives Timothy one more uh, guidance, if you will, one more word of encouragement. And this one, we, we may find this one tough. This one, again, applies to our modern world, especially in the realm of social media and how that influences our attitudes and the way we deal with those we disagree with. Paul says this to Timothy, verse 23, says, Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Have you ever met those people that will just lob a comment out there? Because, I mean, they know it's like a hand grenade they just pulled the pin out of. They know that lobbing that comment out there into a group of people is going to set somebody off. 
they're people that enjoy watching conflict. Even if they themselves don't participate in it, they enjoy stirring up conflict because it gives them, I guess, a sense of power. I caused this. I controlled the situation. That's not what we are called to do as followers of Christ. We are called to not get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. You may say, well, I'm, I find it easy to be patient with people that are well-behaved, easy to get along with, that listen. Yeah, we're called to more than that. Anybody can do that. But as followers of Christ, we are called to be patient with people who we find difficult. And we need to teach them. And to do that, it's going to require patience. And it's going to require not being drug into the fight. You'll find that when people become defensive, they start to fight. I have seen many times in church life this play out where we have activities for for children uh, be it sunday school classes or a vacation bible school or camp or anything and you can tell when a child uh, especially late elementary junior high age is starting to struggle with conviction about their sinful state and you can tell they're getting close to trusting in christ for salvation because in their discomfort and in that conviction they're experiencing by the Holy Spirit in their heart, they get hostile, sometimes flat out mean, angry. They begin to lash out or act out. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. It's painful to become aware of our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. That's not a pleasant place to be. And when people are experiencing that unpleasant situation, sometimes they, they, they flail about. And if you're standing close enough, metaphorically, you're going to get hit. We have to have patience. We have to be kind and not drug into those quarrels so that we can teach. Well, what are we teaching? We're teaching about Christ. We're teaching the gospel. We're teaching that one thing that makes a difference, not just in this life, but for eternity. And so in verse 25, he says this, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change these people's heart or those people's hearts. In other words, it's not up to us to change them. It's up to us to instruct gently, even those that oppose the truth. And then we trust God. Because he didn't say God will. He says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Remember who's saying this? This is Paul in a Roman prison facing his execution. This is also Paul, formerly known as Saul, who beat and imprisoned Christians. And he thought he was doing it for God, but he opposed them. This is a man that knows that God can change a person's heart and they can learn the truth. Have patience. Instruct those that oppose the truth, but do it gently. You will not, I guarantee you, you will not argue someone into the kingdom of God. But you can show them the love of Christ. Give them opportunities to hear the gospel. And perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. And then verse 26, closing out the chapter. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. I love that. Then they will come to their senses. To me, that echoes back to the the story of the prodigal son slopping the hogs, and he looks up and he comes to his senses. 
and realizes his father loves him and goes home. If you know Christ, you came to your senses and you escaped the devil's trap. Don't live like you're still in the trap. Stay grounded in the gospel. Don't get drug into the, the quarrels, the fights. Instead, act in gentleness. Don't get drug into all the extra words and all the debates and all the... Live for Christ. Follow him. Stay pure so that you can be used for an honorable purpose. So that when God uses you in a situation, it makes things special. Make yourself available to him. Be faithful. It's the encouragement of Paul to Timothy. It's God's encouragement through Paul to all of us who seek to follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this word, this word of encouragement, this word of this word of correction. For maybe in our own lives where we have not been gentle in our own lives where we have been distracted by arguments over words, in our own lives where we have settled for God can use me instead of I want to be a clean instrument in God's hands so he can use me for something special. Father, we confess to you that we are sinners. And we fall on your forgiveness given to us through Christ Jesus. Take us and use us for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.